Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to talk about some of the basics of Medicare today. Um, the next week, we're going to get into some of the more expertise, um, deeper dive type Medicare stuff. But for today, we're going to stick to the basics. So if Medicare is something new to you, or if you just like to refresh yourself at the beginning of H AEP, you are in the right place. My name is Chelsea Smith. I am your learning and development specialist here at Action Benefits. And joining me today is the one, the only, Debbie Brown. Um, so, Debbie, go ahead and give the people what they want. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Getting ready for a new AEP, getting your Medicare under wraps. And we're here for you, ready for the ride. Um, put your seatbelts on and your helmets and let's go. Ooh, I know. I, I I don't have my helmet on, so you guys will just have to have to work with me. Just if anything flying around over my head, just let me know so I can duck out the way, right? Okay. So I will say, of all the webinars that I do, this was the one that I tend the most to run over on. So I do apologize. I am going to try to go as level as I can to make sure we get as much information out to you in as in as in as a digestible way possible. So I got to make sure I keep myself on track. So I spend the whole hour on getting everything we need to get to. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So these are the outcomes that we are hoping to get to you today, hoping to be able to get you to define the original parts of Medicare, identify ways to supplement original Medicare, and describe pathways that clients can use to enroll in Medicare. So that sounds really simple. <laughs> Right, but if you've ever worked in Medicare before, you know that this is not as simple as it sounds, right? This is a lot of stuff we're going over today. So let's start from the beginning, defining Medicare. This is the stuff that interests me because I'm a history nerd, but here we go. So I know this stuff is not easy. Please don't go into this thinking that it is. Um, so if you don't get it all right away, that's okay. So just um, follow along as I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a history of the process of Medicare. And you'll see why as I go on, um, seniors and people who, beneficiaries in general, need help understanding all of the ins and outs of Medicare. They need your help, right? Because we, they, you want to find something that fits them just right. And um, that's your job to help them. And it's very difficult to do. So that's where you come in as the expert. So we do have something that goes a little deeper into this on YouTube if you'd like to watch something that's a little deeper in depth, but I'm gonna go over just the very high level stuff. So back on July 30th, 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Medicare and Medicaid Act into law. The law established Medicare Part A to cover inpatient services. So think things like hospital stays, and skilled nursing facilities, stuff like that. And Part B to cover um, outpatient services. So think like going to your PCP, going to your doctor, going to a specialist, getting preventative care, stuff like that. Uh, Medicare is available to everyone who's 65 and older, every, uh, those who have certain disabilities, or those who have end-stage renal disease, or you might hear it in shorthand as ESRD. But the people wanted more. More coverage, of course. So Congress updated the legislation over the years to allow supplemental policies to be provided by private carriers for the purchase for the purchase of by consumers. These policies covered additional items like travel emergencies um, and helped provide financial support to cover deductibles and coinsurance depending on when they were issued. So these plans eventually became standardized in the Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 1990 which a lot of you are going to recognize in its more shorter hand term called COBRA, and that went into effect in 1992. Um, we do have some videos about COBRA as well if you're interested in learning more about that. But you might have recognized, I haven't said the word drug coverage yet, because that didn't come into play until later, much, much later. Congress didn't address drug coverage until the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 and allowed private carriers to begin issuing Part D policies starting in 2006. So what, that's 18 years ago-ish? And 
if you know anything about Medicare already, you know that I've skipped over Part C, but we'll come back to that. Um, in 1997, Congress passed legislation to allow private carriers to enter the senior markets. At that time, these plans were considered Medicare choice plans because they gave consumers the choice between a public or a private option. Later, Medi the Medicare Modernization Act allowed private carriers to bundle excuse me, Part D benefits into the choice plans together and then rebranded them as something called, as we know today, they, we know them as Medicare Advantage plans. Today, these plans combine Part A, B, and usually D together and have embedded benefits like routine dental, vision, hearing, and those other supplemental benefits that you've probably heard about already, silver sneakers, stuff like that. Other benefits could include fitness memberships, like we talked about, support for chronic conditions, and companionship services. Whew. Okay, so now we have five distinct programs that seniors are eligible for, but a variety of legislation and rules governs the ways that these programs can work together. So generally speaking, a beneficiary must always enroll in parts A and B, which is also known as original Medicare. I like calling it vanilla Medicare, uh, to be eligible for other programs like Part C and D and whatever. They'll also be responsible for a Part B premium each month. After enrolling in Parts A and B, a beneficiary has the option of enrolling in one or both of a Medicare supplement policy in a Part D prescription drug plan. A beneficiary also has the option of enrolling in a Part A, enrolling in a Parts A and B alongside with Part C, Medicare Advantage, but it is illegal for a member to enroll in and for agents to sell a supplement or Part D plan to someone enrolled in a Med Advantage plan. Since Med Advantage plans provide the same benefits that a combination of a supplement and a Part D would. So it doesn't let you double dip, I guess. The law will not let you sign up for two things that are fighting against each other and causing more um, costs onto your beneficiary. Whew. Okay, so that's... That's all of the types of beneficiary benefits that beneficiaries can get. So you might understand now why seniors who are just fresh getting into this at 65 or a disabled person or someone with ESRD might walk into this and be like, whoa, um, I need some help. I can't do all this by myself. And that is where you come in to help them pick out the plan and who watches the watchman, who helps the helpers, and that is us here at Action Benefits. We help you help your clients, which is what we're doing here today, learning about this stuff. Okay, so let's get into the details of Original Medicare. So let's start with premium coverage and penalties for parts A and B. So remember, A is for hospital, B is for outpatient, A for in, B for out. So you'll notice at the top right hand side of your screen here, there is a pyramid. Um, and this pyramid kind of depicts the different ways that the, that coverage interacts with one another um, and how they build on each other. So parts A and B are at the very bottom in the corners because they are the cornerstones of your coverage. You have to have parts A and B before you move on to um, things like D, supplemental and C. So those are the two corners of your pyramid. Um, and we are heading into talking about part A right now. So usually, in when we talk about premiums for part A, usually um, beneficiaries don't pay a monthly premium for part A. And that's because you or the spouse, one the spouse or the um, individual, paid Medicare taxes while they were working. This is some, usually it's called uh, premium free part A. I've heard that phrase thrown around sometimes because, again, most people don't end up paying a premium for it. The Federal Insurance Contributions Act, or FICA tax, is a U.S. federal payroll tax imposed on employees and employers to fund Social Security and Medicare. And about 99% of people with Medicare don't pay for Medicare because they worked for at least 40 quarters of Medicare-covered employment. So that I guess that's the little caveat there. You have to make sure you had, like, um, Medicare covered employment is so like legal employment. And as long as you're paying into the Medicare system for at least 40 quarters, you're going to receive Part A for free. Cool. But if you aren't eligible for premium free Part A for whatever reason, you may be able to buy Part A if you're 65 or older and you have enrolled in 
um, or are going to enroll in Part B and meet the citizenship and residency requirements. I believe it's five years of residency in the country. Um, in most cases, if you choose to buy Part A, you must also have Part B and pay the monthly premiums for both. You can't have one or the other. The amount of premium depends on how long you or your spouse worked in Medicare covered employment. So Social Security determines if you have to pay a monthly premium for Part A. Uh, we don't have that estimate for um, Part A premiums for 2025, but in 2024, the Part A premium for a person who worked less than 30 quarters was $505 a month. Um, and those who worked between 30 and 39 quarters of coverage may buy Part A in 2024 for $278. So those are the numbers for last year. We do not have estimates for an official number for um, this year quite yet, um, but stay tuned and I will get that to you once we'll get, we'll be talking about it once we have it. But right now we do not have those figures quite yet. Uh, you, might, you might also pay a premium for part A if you were under 65 disabled and your premium, pre, premium free part A coverage ended because you returned to work. Um, people who are under 65 and disabled may continue to receive premium free Part A for up to 8.5 years after returning to work. So there's a little bit of a um, discrepancies, I guess, there if you, depending on your work situation, if you're under 65. For, but most people in general don't pay for Part A because they, they worked or their spouse worked. Okay. Ooh. So Medicare Part A, also known as hospital certain insurance, I've heard it called that before too, helped cover medically necessary inpatient services. So inpatient hospital care, things like semi-private rooms, meals, general nursing, other hospital services and supplies, as well as care for inpatient rehab facilities and inpatient mental health care in a psychiatric hospital, but that has a lifetime 190 day limit. So all people with Part A are covered for inpatient hospital care when all of these things are true. So you have to check all these boxes. Um, a doctor makes an official order which says you need two or more midnights of medically necessary care to treat your illness or injury and the hospital formally admits you. That's the kicker there, that you have to be admitted. You need the kind of care that can only be given in a hospital. The hospital accepts Medicare. And the Utilization Review Committee of the hospital approves your stay while you're in a hospital. The same goes for similar things go for inpatient skilled nursing facility care, which is, again, not the same as custodial or long term care. If you meet those criteria, that's different. Skilled care involves safe and effective care given by skilled nursing or rehabilitative staff. Skilled nursing and therapy staff includes registered nurses, licensed practical and vocational nurses, physical and occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, and audiologists. Coverage requires a minimum three-day inpatient hospital stay. So these are the Medicare Part A costs for 2024. Again, we do not have any um, 2025 rates or estimates announced yet. So unfortunately, you're just gonna have to work with me here with the 2024 numbers, they're probably going to be a bit similar, um, but don't quote me on that. I don't know for sure. Otherwise, I would have told you. Um, if you have Part A and will be spending some time in the hospital, you'll have to pay a deductible for that first 60 days that you spend in the hospital. And you'll see on the screen for last year slash, I guess this year, depending on how you view it, it was $1,632. That deductible is for 60 days, not per day. But... On the 61st day, if you are still in the hospital, that deductible gets reduced, but you have to pay it every day until you hit 90 days. After that, each beneficiary gets a bank of extra days called lifetime reserve days, and those have a different deductible associated with them. These days can be applied in any increment that you need them, um, but you only get 60, and they stay with you for your whole life, but again, only 60. So you might use two at one time and then 30 in another. You get to choose your own adventure there, but you only get 60. If God forbid you still need more hospital time after that, then you're responsible for 100% of those costs while you were in the hospital. 
you can only spend 190 of those days in a psychiatric hospital, like I mentioned earlier. After a hospital stay, you might find yourself in need of some type of additional care that is outside the scope of a hospital. And for that, you need a skilled nursing facility. Your first 20 days of your benefit, benefit period is free. This time we are working with coinsurances, which means that you'll pay a flat rate per day from day 21 to 100. After that, you're responsible for everything. If you need home health care services, Medicare's got you covered, so long as there are only need, need for intermittent skilled nursing coverage. Okay, a lot of stuff there. So how do these benefit periods actually work? Um, little complication around these as well. So on the previous slide, we talked about benefit periods. They describe the period of time you as the beneficiary are in the hospital or skilled nursing facility, plus another 60 days immediately following that day that you leave. Um, benefit periods are important to understand because they tell us whether or not a beneficiary will be paying the deductible and what amount, depending on how many days they spend in the hospital, how many days you were out from that um, original day. So it's easier to explain this, in my opinion, using an example. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm just going to put the entire example on the screen. Um, like so. So let's say this is our example benefit period. And let's say that you spend five days in the hospital. You'd be responsible for the deductible during that time. Then you leave the hospital and are sent uh, to a skilled nursing facility for 20 days. That didn't cost you anything because the first 20 days don't have any cost sharing associated with them when you go to a SNF, a skilled nursing facility. You return home safe and sound, thank God. And then 60 days later, so long as you don't wind up in the hospital again, you are out of your benefit period. And if you need to go back on the 61st day, so 61 days after, you restart a new benefit period and you have to pay that deductible all over again. But if you entered in like the 59th day, then you stay within that same deduct that benefit period, you don't have to pay that deductible again. So it all depends on what day you enter the hospital, right? So there is a late enrollment penalty associated with Medicare Part A. It generally doesn't qual like uh, doesn't hit most people, right? Because like we talked about earlier, most of us don't pay for Part A. Um, but if you aren't eligible for premium Part A and you don't buy into it when you're first eligible, your monthly premium may go up 10%. You'll have to pay that higher premium for twice the number of years you couldn't had Part A and didn't, you could have had, excuse me, Part A and didn't sign up. So it's not a lifetime penalty like other um, parts of Medicare. It's only 10% for twice the amount of years that you could have had it and didn't. But again, most of us, the vast majority of us, will not need to worry about this penalty in the first place. So should I sign up for Medicare Part A? Every single person is going to have a different answer to this question depending on their personal circumstances. But here are some things to consider on the screen that can help you make that choice for yourself or for your client. So most people don't pay premiums for Part A. So if that's something they're concerned about, then you know if it's a cost thing, probably doesn't matter then. And if the premium is required, then delaying it would trigger most likely a late enrollment penalty. So keep that in mind if they are someone who would have to pay. If the member is covered by a group health plan from employers with fewer than 20 employees, Medicare's secondary payer rules determine that Medicare does pay primary. If members covered by group health plans form one employer with 20 or more employees, Medicare Part A could supplement the group plan. And if the member is covered by individual marketplace plans, eligibility for Medicare removes eligibility for subsidies and advanced premium tax credits. So basically, if they're on the marketplace, Medicare is probably the best choice for them because they're, especially if they're getting those subsidies, which 90 some percent of us are, are, um, but if they're on a group plan and they really like their group plan, as long as they're not going to pay a late enrollment penalty, which I guess they wouldn't because they would have been working most likely unless they got a job five minutes ago, um, it's probably best for them to keep their group coverage if that's what they like. But again, every person's going to be different. There's no right or wrong answer for everyone across the board. Whew, okay, that was a lot. So let's check to see if I did a good job explaining all of this to you all. So Blanche has worked 
as an administrative assistant for most of her career. She will be turning 65 in two months and has not yet received any Social Security benefits. She's unsure whether she will enroll in Medicare Part A. Which of the following reasons might help her, uh, might can help convince her to enroll? Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm going to keep on keeping on here. Most of us got this one correct. The correct answer here is A. She will be eligible for premium free hospital coverage. Uh, for eligible, pre if, if you're thinking of free doctor visits, you're thinking Part B. You're thinking of um, Part B. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, vision and dental benefits, those are supplemental. Probably oftentimes you get those in MedAdvantage, but you don't always get them in MedAdvantage. But that's your thinking part C. See what I did there? A, B, C. Ooh. All right. Um, oh. Now we're heading into part B. Part B is your doctor visits, stuff like that. Again, it is at the bottom right hand corner of our pyramid because it is the foundation of Medicare and you need A and B to get other things. So beneficiaries can purchase part B even if they are not eligible for part A, for free part A, I should say. Part B premiums are always charged monthly. Um, they change yearly, or they can, but uh, they have <laughs> changed every year. There's not been a year that I've worked in this, but they have not changed. The base premium for 2025 is estimated at $185 per month. So for Parts B and D, um, the Medicare trustee report um, estimates what these um, premiums are going to be. So from here on out, I'm going to put a little caveat in everything. I am going to have different numbers from 2024 on the screen. They are estimated. They are not exact. Don't memorize them. Last year, they were only off by a couple cents. I want to say like a dime or a quarter or something like that. But I don't want you going around estimate or um, memorizing these estimates. So they're on the screen. Um, you can use them as like your mental guide, but don't memorize the numbers, okay? They are estimated. So, um, this has nothing to do with paying into FICA Part B, so don't worry about your tax stuff. It's not like Part A. Um, and the reduced premium for immunosuppressive, there is reduced premiums for immunosuppressive drug coverage. Um, that's kind of fairly new, not like brand new, but it's a little new um, that there is different rates for immunosuppressive only coverage that can be like carved out, and you can have that coverage for someone who might need that. Um, and there's a lowered premium for that. It was $103 in 2024, but we don't know what it is for 2025 quite yet. So, okay, for Part B, there's a couple different things that make premiums a little different for Part B. So there is something called the Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount or IRMA. So with IRMA, if a member has a modified adjusted gross income as reported on their IRS tax return form two years ago above a certain amount, it changes um, with the years. The beneficiary will pay a standard premium amount and what is called the N Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount or IRMA. IRMA is an extra charge added on to the premiums. This has been in place since 2007. These income related monthly premium rates affect roughly 5% of people with Medicare. So if you have to pay a higher amount for your Part B premium and you disagree, there is a number that you can call that number down there at the bottom. Um, if you get, if you or your client is given an IRMA charge and you disagree with it. But that is something that you might want to be aware of for some of your clients. Whew. Okay, so again, these figures are, est are estimates and are based on Medicare trustee reports. So don't go memorizing them. But <clears throat> this is the... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, IRMA chart for, um, that I've used every year just with 2025 estimates plugged into it. So as you can see, there is, um, amounts that the individual or the married couple make together and each income bracket has an increase slightly based on, uh, the amount that they make up to lots of money if you make lots of money. Um, and then that base premium, the 185, is the estimated amount base premium for Part B for 2025. Okay. So what does Part B cover? Hey, Let Chelsea, can I just oh. step in for a minute on that yeah, Irma stuff? So, um, yeah. Yeah, just I just wanted to let everybody know that when you guys get anything from your clients on the Irma, 
um, they got a like a because that bill is going to come from um, Social Security and you call our office. We actually don't have any capabilities of looking into that kind of stuff. So your members will have to work with Medicare and um, Social Security and try to figure out that that out. Um, like Chelsea had said, there is a appeal process that you guys can do. And if you Google what are the reasons, there's several reasons of how an appeal can be done, such as loss of income uh, due to a death of a spouse or something like that. Um, we can help as much as we can, but we really can't dive into why you're getting that. So, um, you know, you will have to call Medicare and um work with them or social security and work with them to figure out how to or how they came up with that amount so just wanted to throw that in there yeah they calculate it every every year if i'm if i recall correctly and they use tax information yep. that's two years old so yeah so january pay, yep january so this january they're going to be looking at 2023 income um if that drastically changed from now until then there may be a appeal process that the uh, member can do. And also just another thing that always comes up. Um, yes, if you do join, if you file jointly, and even though your spouse never worked a day in his or her life, they are going to get that IRMA charge, regardless of um, whether they worked or not, based on a joint um, being, FYI, you know, joint. Yeah. Yep, yep. So just FYI. Hey. Okay, thank you. All right, so for the what Part B covers, um, is it covers medically necessary outpatient services and supplies, including doctor services, outpatient medical, uh, surgical services and supplies, um, like for like x-rays and stitches and stuff like that, clinical laboratory services like blood tests, urolysis and screenings, um, durable medical equipment, walkers, wheelchairs, stuff like that, um, diabetic testing supplies, Preventative services like exam tests, screenings, such and such. Um, home health services. Uh, you can have your home health benefits under Part A and Part or Part B. That kind of gets wishy washy depending on how those got um, like prescribed to you. Um, there is a uh, like a informational sheet I can send out if you have more questions about that. But that can get a little diff wonky depending on how those things were. Um, put out to you. Uh, I see a question in the chat really quick. Can we get copies of these slides? Absolutely. Um, I just would have to attach those in the email that you're going to get about 24 hours from now. Thanking you for showing up to the show. Um, I will get you those slides with that email. Um, just about a day from now. You flatter me, you want my slides. Okay, <laughs> so Medicare Part B covered preventative services. So these are the, uh, there's a slew of covered preventative services provided by Medicare, but be aware that these are not the same as what is mandated by ACA non-Medicare plans. So it sounds similar, right? Like, I always think of it as like the 10 commandments of, of the marketplace. It's very similar to that for Part B, <clears throat> but they're not exactly the same. So I'm not going to read them to you just to save some time, but they're there. You'll have the slides later um, that you could take a look at those. Um, keep in mind, too, you're welcome to Medicare visit. That's the only one I really like to point out because a lot of people forget about that um, in your annual wellness exam. And the provider performs a lot of these cognitive function functioning screenings. It can help you to um, catch early signs of dementia and Alzheimer's, which um, if you've kept up with our LinkedIn page, you know that dementia is on the rise and there's way more ways that they can um, pinpoint it earlier than ever before and you're not going to get those um, benefits and keep Alzheimer's at bay if you're not going and getting those um, wellness exams. You can also have your risk of opioid disorders and treatment plans for opioid disorders and stuff like that in that um, annual wellness exam. So there's a lot of benefits to that exam. Make sure you're getting reminding your clients about it and getting them in to get those preventative services to keep them well. Okay, so Medicare Part B costs, costs estimated, again, for 2025, these are based on the Medicare trustee report. And again, our estimates do not memorize these numbers. Um, the yearly deductible will be 257 estimated for 2025. If you have the original Medicare, you'll pay the Part B deductible. Um, 
and this amount will change and does change every year in January. And this means that you will be responsible for the first about $257 of your Medicare approved medical bills in 2025 before Part B starts taking care of any of your uh, bills. Coinsurance for Part B services in general, it's 20% for most covered services for providers accepting assignment. Remember that's important. Make sure that the accept assignment um, a member might pay 20% of every doctor visit after they've met their annual deductible, but there is no limit to this 20% and there is no out-of-pocket maximum. Durable medical equipment is covered at 20% when the deductible is met. And most preventative services do not have coinsurance and the Part B deductible does not apply as long as, again, the provider accepts assignment. An assignment, um, for those of us who don't know, is the agreement between Medicare and healthcare providers and suppliers to accept the Medicare approved amount as payment in full. So Part B does have a late enrollment penalty attached to it as well. If you don't enroll in Part B when you were eligible, your monthly premium will go up about 10% for each year you could have signed up for Part B but didn't. Unlike Part A, this penalty is um, applied for life. So it is a little bit of a heftier decision, I guess, um, to not to backtrack signing up for Part B if you um, choose to do that because you're, that penalty is going to stick for the rest of the time that you have Part B. So should I sign up for Medicare Part B? If you're already getting Social Security benefits, you'll automatically be enrolled in Medicare Part A and B without additional application. The Part B premium is usually deducted from monthly Social Security, real retirement, or federal retirement payments. The amount depends on your income and when you enrolled in Part B, as we learned about earlier with those late enrollment penalties. If you delay enrollment, you'll have that penalty. People who don't get a retirement payment or whose payment isn't enough to cover the premium, get a bill from Medicare for their Part B premiums, and you can pay that by credit card, check, money order, whatever. Um, having an employer or union coverage while your spouse or family member is disabled is still working can affect your Part B enrollment rates. Um, this also includes things like federal, state employment, TRICARE, and active duty military service. Whew. Okay, Debbie, did I miss anything? Is there anything you'd like to add before I turn on this knowledge check? No, I am putting in the chat. Um, you could actually, there is actually a Part B calculator that you can figure out somebody's Part B um, penalty. Um, so you can use that and it works very well. We use it quite a bit in our office. So I, just I tried to make it. one for us. Like I tried to make one ourselves, like my, myself. Um, turns out that's not easy. <laughs> you can't just make no. a calculator on your own. Um, right. So I did try to make one. Yep. So it just hasn't. So happened. it's in there. It yeah, it's in there somewhere. Oh, so you put it in the, um, the chat. Yep, I put it in the chat. Yep. I'll throw it in that email too. Um, that okay. I'm going to give everyone so that everyone okay. can. Okay. Anyway. Let's stay on track so that we don't run out of time. So Blanche turns 65 in two months. Her family has a history of colorectal cancer. She's worried about how she's going to pay for the screenings. What might you say to her? Okay, so everyone who answered this one got it correct. The correct answer is B. Medicare Part B requires a zil zero dollar copay excuse me for most preventative services so she should not be worried about getting that screening because um part b will probably cover that with uh no cost to her Whew, okay supplemental plans here we go so you'll notice that the top of the pyramid is now highlighted we have gotten to the top of the pyramid um this is where you get uh, benefits that add on additionally to parts A and B. Um, and these run a little differently than A and B, so let's get into that. So Medicare Supplement Insurance, or you might have heard the term Medigap before, is health insurance sold by private insurance companies to fill gaps in original Medicare. Medigap policies can help you share things like co-insurance, co-payments, and deductibles uh, of the costs of Medicare-covered services. Some Medigap policies also cover certain benefits that original Medicare might not cover. We'll get into that in a moment. Medigap policies don't cover your share of the costs under other types of health coverage, including standalone Medicare prescription drug plans or PDPs, 
employer union group health coverage or GHPs, Medicaid, Departments of Veteran Affairs, VA benefits, or TRICARE. In all states except for Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, Medigap policies must be one of the standardized plans A, B, C, D, E, F, G, K, L, M, N. No E, sorry. I got excited, so I can say the alphabet. So they, so they can be easily compared. <laughs> Each plan has a set of benefits that are the same for any insurance company. Benefits are the same, but the cost of each plans can vary. Each company decides which Medigap policies it will sell and the price for each plan with state review and approval. Other differences include pre-existing condition waiting periods, crossover of claims for Medicare administrative contract or to a Medigap policy, guaranteed issues, stuff like that. So there is the premium is determined kind of by an attained age, a community pool, an agent issue. <clears throat> Uh, that's something that might that you'll get into a little bit more next week with the more expertise stuff. So, Medicare supplement premiums are charged monthly and vary by plan, carrier, and locale. They are community aided, community rated, issue age rated, attained age rated, and medical underrating if applicable is sometimes utilized. Premiums are still charged to those who choose a Medigap plan. You'll still pay your Part A premium if that's something that is affecting you, and you'll still pay your Part B premium as well. Uh, so if you get a med sub plan, you'll have to pay two premiums for your health care. Keep that in mind. There used to be one that paid your premium for you. That's not a thing anymore. <sighs> okay. So these numbers are, again, for 2024. Um, we will not see 2025 figures for a bit. Uh, med, su med sup plans are standardized, so no matter what carrier provides that plan, it will be the same. Here on the screen are the different plans in totality, but not all carriers cover them all. Carriers will choose which plans they will carry and which they will not, but laws in each state might affect that choice. For example, all carriers who offer Medigap plans have to offer plans A, C, and F if they offer any at all. Not all plans will be available for those who are not over 65. So like we talked about earlier, those who might be disabled or have ESRD or immunosuppressive, stuff like that. Um, but at least one has to be made available to them. And if I remember correctly from my time looking at coverage for one, I believe it's usually part A that they offer. Um, if they if that's the, like the required one is generally part A, or I'm sorry, um, plan A. Plan F and G also offer a high deductible plan in some states. With this option, you must pay for Medicare covered costs and the deductible, which is up to $2,800 in 2024. You don't have the numbers 2025 quite yet. K and L, after you meet your out-of-pocket yearly limit and your yearly Part B deductible, the Medigap plan pays 100% of covered services for the rest of the year. Um, plan N pays 100% of Part B coinsurance. You must pay a co-payment of up to $20 for some office visits and an up to $50 co-payment for emergency room visits that don't require an inpatient admission. So, yeah, for with, if you're going to sell these, um, I would save this chart. And um, whenever the new numbers come out in February for the out-of-pocket limit, save that one instead. But generally, this is about the checks and X's are going to stay the same. Okay, so how to enroll in a med sup plan. So because supplement plans are guaranteed issue or guaranteed acceptance, usually the best time to buy a Medigap policy is during your Medigap, Medi Medigap open enrollment period or your OEP. It begins when you are 65 or older and enrolled in Part B for the first time. You also have to have Medicare Part A to have a Medigap policy. You have six months at, um, guaranteed issue to buy a Medigap policy at that point. Some states might have a little longer, but we in Michigan, we've got our six months. Um, during your Medigap OEP, companies can't do any of this stuff. They cannot refuse to sell you the Medigap policy. Um, they can't make you wait for coverage. And they can't charge more because of your past or present health problems. You may want to apply for Medigap policy before your Medigap OEP starts. If your current health insurance ends the month you become eligible for Medicare or you reach 65 to make sure you don't have any gaps in coverage. 
Um, and you might also buy a Medigap policy whenever a company agrees to sell you one. However, there might be restrictions such as medical underwriting or a waiting period for pre-existing conditions. Medica medical underwriting is a process used by uh, health insurance companies to try to figure out your health status um, to determine if they want to offer you coverage or not and at what price and what exclusions and what limits. So if you're going outside of that non-guaranteed issue time and you know that you have a medical condition, might be a good idea um, to get it during that guaranteed issue period instead to make sure you know you're going to get the plan you want. Um, because once you hit that non-guaranteed issue area, it's gonna you might have a hard time um, getting the premium you want or getting it at all. So I launched the question for you. Blanche has made the leap and enrolled in Medicare Part A and B. She's looking forward to minimizing her out-of-pocket costs in the event she needs to be hospitalized. Which course of action might be a good fit for her? This should be an easy one. Uh, part A covers hospital services, um, so part so A is out. C is out because Medicare Parts A and B, I wish it covered 100% everything all the time, but it doesn't do that. Um, so plan B or N would be a good option for her if that's what she wanted to do. Okay, Medicare Part D, D for drugs, all right. Medicare Part D is Medicare prescription drug coverage. If you choose original Medicare and want to add prescription drug coverage, um, you would you must choose and join a Medicare prescription drug plan, and you usually pay a premium for these. These plans are run by private companies that contract with Medicare. You cannot sign up for a Medicare Part D plan through CMS. So if someone's trying to sign, sell you a CMS Part D plan, they don't know what they're talking about or they're scamming. Don't do that. Medicare contracts with private insurance companies that offer prescription drug plans to people with Medicare. Everyone with Medicare can get Medicare prescription drug coverage by enrolling in a Medicare drug plan. You might pay a penalty if you join late and you might get this coverage from an MA plan because some, a lot of times those uh, drug coverages are built into the MA plan. Costs vary and um, like I said, most people pay a premium. So Medicare Part D is Medicare prescription drug coverage. If you choose original Medicare and you want that, you have to join these plans. The premium is not automatically deducted from Social Security like it is with Part D, so you'll have to pay that. Um, Part D plans are optional, but they may incur a lifetime penalty for late enrollment. High income beneficiaries, again, just like with Part D, might be subject to IRMA, and IRMA is deducted from the Social Security benefit. IRMA does not have an impact on premium charges by carriers. So just like before, these numbers are estimated for 2025. This is from the um, trustee report. So as you can see here, it's a little more difficult to um, determine exactly what your IRMA, your total premium will be for Part D because each um, Part D plan has a different premium, but, it's e but we can determine the additional costs plus the premium. Um, and again, these are estimated for 2025. Okay, so cost sharing phases. This is the stuff that's changed. So listen up. So there are now three phases instead of four with your Medicare Part D cost sharing phases. So first is your deductible pay phase. And some, some plans will not have this phase and you'll skip right to initial. If you do have a deductible, you would be in here. Um, and for 2025, no deductible can be higher than $590, but each plan is going to change that. And then some don't have a deductible at all. For some plans, you'll start here in the initial coverage phase. Um, there is co-pays co and co-insurance that vary by plans. Enrollees pay 25%, Part D plans pay 65%, and manufacturers pay 10%. You'll remain in this phase until your total drug cost reach, reaches $2,000. So much, 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 much less than your out-of-pocket maxes in previous years, you might notice. And then you get into your catastrophic phase. So this is new for next year. In this stage, you are not responsible for any of your Part D drug costs. Woo! 
the manufacturer, the plan, and Medicare are responsible instead for the rest of the calendar year after that $2,000 point is reached. This is totally different than 2024, where there was a much higher out-of-pocket max and the Part D plan paid 20% at that point. Um, and Medicare is responsible for 80. So a little different. A um, lot more responsibility for payment placed on the um plan and uh, a little bit more on the manufacturer than in the past. So good thing for your um, beneficiaries here, they're gonna be paying a lower cost overall. There's, there's also the Medicare prescription drug payment program, but we don't really have time to get into that today. We do have a um, Part D redesign YouTube video uh, webinar recording if you are interested in learning more information about this. So there are some late enrollment penalties associated with Part D as well, just like with Part B. Um, you will have a penalty if you don't enroll when you are first eligible, or if you have a break in credible drug coverage that lasts more than 63 days. Your late enrollment penalty is determined annually, is based on 1% of the average national base Part D premium, it compounds for every month that you are eligible for Part D and did not get Part D, um, and it is lifetime. You keep that penalty for the rest of the time that you have Part D, and it is added on to the premium. So you pay that in addition to your premium that you are already paying. So I know what you're thinking, and I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about this because we do have other um, resources available for you to look at to learn more about the um, credible coverage things that happen. Um, but I know that you, some of you are thinking about it in the audience. Um, so yes, this um, change might affect whether or not your plan, your group plan, or um, the plan that your uh, beneficiary was on before is considered credible or not, which then again affects whether or not they're going to be paying that late penalty. Um, coverage is must be as good or better than Part D to be considered credible. Um, and they're going to use simplified methods most likely to determine that credibility status and that might continue to leave that being credible. Um, carriers sometimes have credible coverage charts or mailers. If you are interested, they are in the credible coverage charts for Priority and Blue Cross are available on insurability. So that's something you want to look at. And make sure that you get your credible coverage letter from your employer, from your client, if they are someone who continued to take employer coverage after 65, so they don't get that late enrollment penalty. If they don't have that letter, even if that credible coverage was credible, there's going to be some struggles. So just make sure they have that letter from the get. Um, I noticed Debbie put the Part D calculator into the chat already. Awesome. Thank you, lady. So again, if you want to know what that penalty would be um, estimated for that person or for your clients, you can use that calculator. Whew, okay, should I sign up for Medicare Part D? If you're already getting Social Security benefits, you'll automatically be enrolled in Medicare Part A and B without an application, but Part D is a little different. Um, you should sign up for Part D if you want to avoid those late penalties. And if you um, don't have what's considered credible coverage from a pharmacy, uh, or I'm sorry, if you don't have credible coverage from another source. Um, so again, if you are um, working with a client who has a high deductible health plan, um, it might be beneficial just to grab a um, standalone prescription drug plan so they don't have to pay those penalties later. Um, but you might not need Part D if that um, health plan that they have is considered credible um, or if they have coverage that is as good as Medicare's. So this decision is going to be a little different for clients this year um, than it has been in the past. So keep that in mind as you um, sell those Med Advantage plans and those Part D plans um, to your clients. Okay, Medicare Advantage. Debbie, is there anything that you would like to add or anything I missed before I keep going? Uh, just real quick, just remind uh, to the reminder to the agents, if your member is past age 65 and they're coming off of your plan, they will receive a declaration of prior prescription drug form and um, will need to be filled out. You can send those forms over to us. We follow up to make sure that that LEP is removed or not put on their policy, but they will get it if they're past the age of 65. 
So just an FYI. Awesome. Thank you, lady. All right. Medicare Advantage. We'll see if we can do this in six minutes. All right. So Medicare Advantage or Part C plans are another alternative to original Medicare. They're offered by private companies, but are still bound by Medicare rules and regulations. These plans represent an all-in-one approach to Medicare. They combine Parts A and B into one plan and usually off offer additional benefits like dental, vision, hearing, um, and some of them also offer Part D prescription drug coverage. Um, in all cases, a prerequisite to enrolling in Medicare Advantage is the beneficiary has to already be enrolled in Parts A and B. You probably already knew that. And beneficiaries still have to pay their Part B premium or have it deducted from their Social Security benefits that they're receiving, even if they have Part C or a MedAdvantage plan. So for some, it's important to note that Medicare Advantage plans are administered by private carriers and not by the government. Instead, the government pays a fixed amount to these plans to administer the benefits on behalf of the government. MA plans may have different out-of-pocket costs than original Medicare does. This means that each carrier might determine its own premiums, co-pays, and co-insurance percentages. Um, it might be the case that two neighbors are enrolled in parts A and B and have similar incomes, but and these neighbors would probably assume that they would have similar out-of-pocket costs for their care, but if they enroll in different Medicare Advantage plans, they are going to have or potentially have different out-of-pocket costs depending on how their plan is designed. So they're not necessarily always going to be the same, um, which is the beauty of the beauty and the hindrance of these type of plans. So because they're managed by um, private carriers, there might be different rules for accessing these services when compared to original Medicare as well. HMO plans might require a different referral to see specialists on original Medicare or not cover care received out of network, right? So you might wonder why a beneficiary might choose to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. And a Medicare Advantage plan is required to cover everything that original Medicare covers except for hospice care, including emergency and urgent care. Hospice care is covered by original Medicare and hospice benefits continue to be covered by original Medicare, even if they have a MedAdvantage plan, but there can be some differences between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. Those differences can be in how much is paid out of pocket um, when you receive that care. So Medicare Advantage always offers at least the same coverage as original Medicare and may offer additional benefits. It may be one way of adding coverage for routine vision, or dental services, dentures, stuff like that. Some Medicare Advantage plans have a $0 premium. However, regardless of how much you pay for a Medicare Advantage plan, again, you're gonna have to pay that Part B premium. So keep that in mind. It's, it's the, the Advantage portion is free, but you still have to pay your Part B premiums. Some of them have a give back. Well, that helps you pay towards your Part B, um, but not all of them. So also another benefit is you're going to have only one card um, that covers all of their coverage instead of a red, white, and blue card, and then a Part A card, B card, D card, so many cards. You just have one card. Beautiful. Okay, I know we only have two minutes left. I tried my best to go as fast as I could without hindering your learning abilities. So if you need to leave, please feel free to do so. I will not be upset. But if you stick with me for a few more minutes, I appreciate you. And we will talk briefly about Medicare enrollment as promised. Okay, I like to just have everything on the screen from the get. Okay, so there are a couple of different times that someone can enroll in Medicare. Uh, most people tend to enroll in their initial enrollment period, which is when they first turn 65, um, or for people who might have like ESRD, something like that. Um, they enroll in parts A and B, and then you can enroll in C and D after that. Um, this period lasts from three months before your 65th birthday and the three months after and the month of your 65th birthday. So it's a seven month period of time. So you also will have automatic enrollment. There might be some times, I guess I should say, when um, you might have an automatic enrollment in Medicare. So if you're collecting Social Security prior to turning age 65, you'll get Medicare automatically, 
technically the package is mailed out three months prior to your 65th birthday, which means you would have to be getting Social Security about four months prior to turning 65 in order to be automatically enrolled. But again, that's only if you were already enrolled in Social Security. If you're 65 and not enrolled in Social Security, then you need to enroll yourself in Medicare. So the non-automatic non enrollment process is, just like I said, if the client isn't automatically enrolled in Medicare, you have to take active steps to be enrolled by contacting Social Security three months before you turn 65. Um, or when you find out you have ESRD, I guess, is the other time too. Um, there's some more details on the screen, but you can read periods that you can enroll in. There's the general enrollment period, the special enrollment period, annual enrollment period, and the MA open enrollment period. So general enrollment period is January 1st through March 31st, and this is if you missed your IEP, and you can enroll in parts A and B if you so choose. Um, if you get a special enrollment period, that's if you like change jobs, get married, divorce, stuff like that, um, move. Um, you would get certain types of windows of time where you can enroll um, because of the change that you experienced in your life. Um, usually, you get eight months from the termination of that employer coverage if it's a loss of job thing, um, but each one is a little different as to how long you get depending on what um, life event you experience. And then, as we all know, we have the annual enrollment period, which goes on from October 15th through December 7th, where you can enroll in a Med Advantage plan or a Part D plan or change your Part C or D plans. And then finally, we have the MAOEP. We like to call it a like plan change just for um, simplification purposes. Um, but we'll go into those a little deeper into the expertise course. Um, that goes on from January 1st to March 31st. And this is for people with Med Advantage plans. Whew, okay, so I know that was a little fast. Um, Debbie, is there anything else you would like to say? I uh, just want to say thanks to everybody for joining us today. And if you need anything, we have uh, seven strong team members in the individual Medicare department. If you need anything, you can just email individual at actionbenefits.com and any one of us can help you out, get you through this AEP. And we wish you all luck and great success. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank you for spending time with me today and um, have a great rest of your day. Have a great AEP.